Well, good afternoon, and thank you for being here for today's seminar. Um, be aware of the exit signs in case we need to leave the uh, room on short notice. Um, before we get started, though, we want to encourage folks that are viewing on the internet uh, regarding questions for the Q&A, please send your questions to sierrarm at calepa.ca.gov. That address should be on the monitor on the bottom. Uh, send them as soon as you can so that we have time on the air for the Q&A. So with that, Shannon. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Uh, good afternoon and welcome. It's my pleasure to introduce the speaker today, Dr. Rob Harley. And for those of you who don't know him or are not aware of his resume, uh, Rob is a professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, where he's been on the faculty since uh, 1993. He holds a bachelor's degree in engineering science with chemical engineering option from the University of Toronto and both MS and PhD in environmental engineering science from Caltech. Uh, he's also the inaugural holder of uh, the Carl W. Johnson Endowed Chair in Civil Engineering at Berkeley, awarded in recognition of his record of scholarship and university and professional service. And I think he just told me like an hour back that uh, he has just been appointed as a chair starting July 1st of the same department. So congratulations, Rob. Uh, Rob's primary area of uh, research focuses on air quality and sustainable transportation. And as you all know, today he will talk about his uh, efforts at uh, measuring heavy duty emissions uh, near the port of Falkland at the time when the phase one of the dredge uh, truck rule was being implemented. So that would be like in uh, sampling in 2011 and 2013. Uh, his work as well as uh, other ARB funded studies continue to show that the PM and NOx emissions from dredge uh, as well as on-road fleets continue to decrease in California. Uh, the results of which are obviously important in our efforts to achieve air quality reductions and health benefits. So without further ado, Rob. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Shannon. Hi, everyone. Uh, I think before I get going, I just wanted to say that it's uh, uh, welcome, actually, totally fine if you want to ask technical clarification type questions as we go. Um, maybe, uh, you know, when the slide is up on the screen is a better time than waiting till the end when, uh, when we've kind of gone past the point. So maybe big, uh, big picture philosophy or, or policy questions, maybe we should try and avoid getting into those so much during the middle of the talk. But any, any kind of technical details, ask away uh, uh, as we go. That's uh, uh, totally fine to do that. Uh, let's see now. Let's move ahead. Uh, I want to start with some acknowledgments uh, of my co-authors, Chelsea Preble and Tim Dahlman, are students at UC Berkeley. Uh, Tom Kirchstetter has really been uh, leading the fieldwork component of the study. Uh, and then uh, Nathan Kreisberg and Suzanne Herring uh, are collaborators at Aerosol Dynamics who helped a lot on the particle-related measurements, uh, ultrafine particles and size distributions. Also want to thank the Air Resources Board for sponsoring uh, this, uh, this project, uh, the National Science Foundation for support uh, uh, for Chelsea Preble's time and efforts. I also wanted to thank actually numerous ARB staff. I think I need to uh, give a special call out to Chandon as the project manager, but we've had lots of help from other folks at ARB, uh, and it's really appreciated. And I also wanted to thank Bay Area Air Quality Management District, who funded our very first efforts at the port and provided a mobile lab that we were able to use in this study. So they've, they've been really helpful to us as well, and all of the, all of the support, financial and otherwise, is greatly uh, appreciated. Okay. Moving along, I have a couple of introductory slides. Uh, probably uh, many of you will, will know this, but I'll just, uh, just go over it to make sure uh, those, those of you who aren't sort of diesel uh, gurus will uh, be up to speed and stay with us. Uh, so probably most of you know there is a major effort that's going on nationally to reduce uh, emissions from diesel engines. Uh, and uh, the core component of the national effort is uh, more stringent uh, emission standards for the brand new engines. And I have a slide on that in a minute. Then in California, the, the, those standards are, are, uh, are, are part of the uh, program, but there's also uh, uh, efforts to accelerate uh, the uh, replacement of what we call the legacy fleet, right? The old trucks that are still on the road uh, prior to these advanced uh, or more stringent emission standards were in effect. So uh, there's a statewide rule to uh, require trucks and buses uh, to be cleaned up. Uh, and over the next couple of years, 
uh, we're expecting widespread uh, use of advanced PM emission controls by 2016 or so. There's a few uh, special cases, small fleets and such, that might have a little bit more time. Uh, and then by 2023, we expect near universal uh, use of advanced technology for NOx control on the in-use diesel fleet. So nationally, you know, it's just going to be natural fleet turnover. And in California, the, the, the thing is going to be forced at a much quicker rate to, to replace or, or uh, well, mainly to replace the uh, legacy fleet of older engines that had higher, uh, higher emissions. And then right at the spear point, if you like, of the program in California has been a focus on drayage trucks. Drayage trucks are used for short trips in and out of the ports and rail yards. Uh, and historically, it was a very old uh, fleet of trucks, and it's been uh, modernized and cleaned up. And it was, uh, I would call it, one of the earliest action items, right? Sort of a preview in some sense of coming uh, broader efforts statewide to clean up the, the, the legacy fleet of in-use diesel emissions. Okay, so here's a picture showing the, uh, the national emission standards for NOx and PM from heavy-duty diesel trucks. And you can see there have been various steps down over time. Uh, the, the horizontal axis is the model year of the engine, right? So we'll, we'll have this kind of tension during the seminar that sometimes we'll be talking about calendar year, which includes a mix of different ages. Sometimes we'll be talking about the way, the way emissions are regulated. It, it's based on the model year of the engine. Uh, and so this is, this is really applying to new engines in a given year. And so for PM in black... You can see uh, really one major step down in the early 90s. Uh, I've normalized this all so they can both be on the same scale. But if you, if you want brake per, gram per brake horse per hour numbers, it was 0.6 for PM. Then that first big step down is to 0.1. It was like a little pre-step for a couple of years. And then another order of magnitude reduction uh, starting in 2007 to 0.01 grams per horse per hour hour. So really something like a 98 or 99% reduction in PM emissions relative to the oldest sort of early, early, late 1980, early 1990 vintage engines. For NOx, there's maybe a larger number of steps. Uh, and the, the, the last step uh, that's really uh, pushed the use of advanced emission control technologies started with 2010 engines. It's a slightly different schedule, right? 2007 for the, new, uh, for the, for the PM side, 2010 for NOx. I see a question there, please. Yeah, the question is, is, is this the federal or uh, California standards? And what I'm showing here are federal. So there were, there were for a while, and especially in the earlier years, California had uh, separate standards. And also going forward, there's uh, you know, some, some new uh, uh, next steps down even beyond what's shown here uh, for, for new diesel engines as well. But this, this is the federal picture. Uh, so I mentioned the use of advanced control technologies. So if you want just simple words to think about this, you should think about filters for PM control and catalytic converters for NOx control. Okay, and these are, these are the advanced controls that are starting to be used starting in 2007, the filters for PM. In 2010, the catalytic converters for NOx. And uh, on the filter side, which is really going to be the focus of my seminar today, we'll have a little bit on SCR, but it's not, it's not yet the major storyline at the port. The port was really, uh, of Oakland, where we'll be uh, talking about results, was really focused on, on PM control and filters so far. Uh, so these uh, filters, as, as I mentioned earlier, are pretty much standard equipment now on all new engines since the 2007 model year. Uh, and it's possible to retrofit this kind of filter control device on older engines, and the Port of Oakland work we'll see features a lot of that retrofitting kind of activity. Uh, instead of replacing the whole engine, just try and put a filter and keep it going uh, for longer at lower cost. Uh, there's a key issue with the filters is that as particles accumulate on them, the filter plugs up. And if you don't take care of that, after a certain amount of time, the engine stops running, right? Because the exhaust is basically plugged or the filter fails. So you have to find a way to regenerate the filter to get the accumulated particles off so that the exhaust flow can continue, uh, can continue uh, flowing out through the filter. And there are various approaches used for doing that regeneration. Uh, the retrofits, typically it was a passive system where the NO, the NOx present in the engine out exhaust, was deliberately oxidized to NO2. And then the NO2 was the regenerative agent right, that would oxidize off the accumulated particles on that filter. Uh, there's also uh, active schemes, on, especially on some of the newer engines, where there's sensors for the pressure in the exhaust, and uh, if needed, uh, small amounts of fuel can be added, and you can use a thermal oxidative process to clean out the filter 
um, intermittently, right, as needed, if the, if the passive regeneration isn't keeping up with the uh, accumulation of, filter, of particles on the filter. So I'll say a little bit about the NOx uh, side of things as well, this catalytic converter or SCR system for controlling NOx. Uh, it's used as pretty much standard equipment on 2010 and newer engines. Uh, it's harder, much harder to retrofit this on older engines because there's a lot more integration with the engine computer and uh, ancillary equipment that's required. So this is not, whereas the filters really could be retrofit, SCR is much tougher to think about retrofitting on older engines. Um, diesel exhaust, you're running lean, there's excess air. So the exhaust environment is oxidizing. And from a chemical perspective, we want to reduce NOx to N2 rather than oxidize it. And so that's very difficult to do uh, without a reducing agent present. And so we actually add, uh, let's see here, you see the diesel exhaust fluid being added into the exhaust. We need a chemical source of reducing power, right, to deal with the NOx emissions because the exhaust environment is still oxidizing. Uh, and so this uh, diesel exhaust fluid is a mixture of urea and water. And the urea uh, uh, is converted into ammonia and CO2. And so we, get, we then use the ammonia as the reducing agent um, to react with NOx and to, to convert things to N2. Okay, so you'll be hearing a lot about diesel particle filters in this uh, seminar. And you'll be hearing some about selective catalytic reduction, which is sort of the next step for the NOx control side of things. Uh, here's just some... Uh, Details of the drayage truck regulation, which I remember I talked about that in my introductory slide as one of the earliest action items, right, for controlling diesel emissions. Uh, so this was at ports and rail yards. And uh, the first thing was to ban the old, really oldest engines, 1993 and older, were no longer allowed into the ports. Uh, and then to say the 1994 to 2003, the middle age engines, if you like, they had to be retrofit with a filter if they were going to continue to serve the ports. And then uh, 2004 and newer engines were initially fine to use. And then there was kind of a, a, a few more uh, steps to take care of the 2004, 5, and 6 engines, which um, you know, had a free pass in the first round, but, but then had to have filters. And then everything with 2007 and newer had a filter when it was new, when it was originally built. So there was no retrofitting needed for those newest engines. So uh, the present study that I'll be talking about today focuses on the results of our in-use emission measurements of drayage trucks at the Port of Oakland. Uh, and the timing was November 2011, right? So let me just uh, highlight just before the second row of the table, and then in spring 2013, just after the third row of the table. Okay, we also had some baseline measurements up here before any of the drayage truck control uh, from fall of 2009. Okay, so we have basically, uh, we've been intervening or watching, if you like, at intervals just in between various steps of the drainage truck regulation as it was phased in uh, over time. Uh, so here's our uh, map showing our field site, the Port of Oakland in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, you can see there's, uh, uh, or you can probably imagine, there's a lot of diesel engine, diesel powered equipment, including large ocean going vessels that are docking in the berths you see uh, around the edges here, right? There's berths all around there. There's two large uh, rail yards with a lot of diesel locomotive equipment. And then there's trucks coming in and out of the port as well as yard equipment moving things, uh, moving containers, mostly containers, uh, on, and off, uh, on and off the ships. Uh, there's also some major freeways. The Bay Bridge is just north. And Interstate I-80, I-880, comes around the community of West Oakland. Uh, it's highlighted in yellow there. So we have a community a uh, really immediate neighbor uh, to this port. Uh, and there's been a you know, really large increase in the number of containers moving in out and uh, sort of a, a concern about the disproportionate burden of all of this diesel engine emissions on this neighboring community right, uh, right side the port. Uh, it's a little bit harder to see, but there's a yellow star here, which is our field sampling location, okay, where we were set up. And I have a picture of that right here. Uh, so there's the mobile laboratory, uh, the white van parked on the bridge. And this is 7th Street, the main, one of the main access roads into the port. The trucks drive underneath on, the, on this port access road. And you can see our sampling line hanging off the bridge uh, and lining up pretty well with the vertical exhaust pipes of the individual trucks as they drive under this bridge. Uh, the roadway is basically level. 
uh, and there's a traffic light uh, upstream before the trucks get to this location. So I would describe the driving conditions as either cruise at, at 30 miles an hour, roughly, or a little bit of acceleration as they pull away from, uh, as the light changes. Uh, I think one other point I just want to emphasize, because there's been a lot of confusion about this, people say, oh, well, there's all this ship emissions, or there's the Bay Bridge emissions, there's all of these, these other sources around, and are you doing an ambient air study of the port? And the answer is no, we're doing an emission study. We're doing plume captures of these individual trucks, and all of those other sources that people mention as being present, those are part of our background. Okay, we subtract out the background, of, and even if it's port-related, of other sources at the port or general traffic in the vicinity, all of that is subtracted out, and we look at the increase in above background associated with individual trucks. So we're really doing a truck emission study, not an ambient air study at the port. And I, um, because there's been such epic confusion over that question in the past, I just thought I'd say that as clearly and loudly as I can so that you all can help me stamp out the confusion in future discussions of these results. Okay, it's, an, it's, a, it's a plume capture study. We're looking specifically and directly at the emissions from the individual trucks as they drop by. Okay, so here's more details on the measurements that were made of the, uh, of the concentrations in the plumes of these individual exhausts, uh, of these individual trucks. All of these measurements were made at one second or faster time resolution. So, you know, in our ambient air monitoring, we, we often report hourly average concentrations. That's way too slow time resolution. We need to, the, the, the dynamics of the plumes are, you know, 10 seconds or less, and we need to be able to capture these rapid rising and falling concentrations as individual trucks drive by. So, you know, I would say even faster than one hertz uh, sampling frequency is desirable in this kind of application. Anyway, there's a list of pollutants there. I won't go through in detail all the pollutants and the measurement methods, but I will point out a couple of things. One is that we're measuring not only the total NOx, but we're also measuring specifically the NO2 fraction. Remember in the earlier slide, I talked about the passive regen of the filters. We deliberately oxidize NO to NO2. And so then there's a concern about not just the total amount of NOx, but the speciation of the NOx, the split between the NO and the NO2 form, and I'll have results on that later. We're measuring the NO2 by difference, NOx minus NO. And those of you who know about chemiluminescent, chemiluminescent analyzers, uh, you know that, well, you can have them bounce back and forth, right, between total NOx mode and NO only mode. We don't do that. We actually have two NOx analyzers. We have one sitting in total NOx mode all the time, and another sitting in NO only mode all the time. And so we subtract uh, measurements made at the same time, rather than, well, five seconds in this mode and then five seconds in this mode. We, we need, uh, because the, the dynamics of the plumes are so fast, we can't afford to be switching modes between total NOx and NO. We have to have two analyzers. Um, okay, uh, other comments. The particle size distribution. I want to thank Kathleen Kazawa from ARB for loaning us uh, the instrument here. Uh, traditional versions of this scan over a period of several minutes. The FMPS simultaneously right, measures in a lot of different size bins the particle number counts. Uh, and so that was important, again, to have fast, fast response measurements because the dynamics of the plumes are so quick. Uh, we calculate our emission factors by carbon balance. That's to say we normalize each of the pollutants interest, of interest to CO2 in the denominator. And we, knowing some details of the fuel composition and combustion stoichiometry, we can calculate emission factors grams or number of grams of pollutant or number of particles per kilogram of diesel fuel burned. And if you want per horsepower hour, you just need brake specific fuel consumption. And then you can convert between gram per fuel and gram per unit of work output by the engine. So that, that's, uh, you know, it's not maybe the unit you're familiar with from diesel emission regulations, but it's an easy conversion if you want that. If you want the gram per kilowatt hour or gram per horsepower hour, you just need to apply brake specific fuel consumption. Uh, finally, a, a nice feature of the work we did for ARB that we didn't have in the very first year was a lot of, uh, it's labor intensive, but we took a lot of license plate images. And so we're able to, uh, then with um, help from ARB staff, we were able to get from the drayage truck registry, we were able to get uh, information about the trucks, such as not only model year, but retrofit status and who did the retrofit even. Uh, so lots of, lots of fine scale detail about the, about the individual trucks. Any questions on the measurements? Okay. Yeah. 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 
Okay, good question. So the question is, what, you know, what is the engine load and uh, how do we go from grams per kilogram to gram per horsepower hour uh, from these data? So I think the main answer is, uh, if you look at the engine map of fuel consumption as a function of engine RPM and, uh, and, and engine load, uh, for diesel engines, they're pretty flat. Right? The, the B, so BSFC is not something that varies a lot with engine load. Obviously, the, you know, depending on what the truck is doing, the fuel consumption is going up and down, but the fuel consumption is going up and down with the engine load in a very proportional way. Uh, gasoline engines are a little more variable in that way, but diesel engines are kind of your best case for having a fairly stable value. Maybe there's 10 or 20% variation in BSFC, but it doesn't go up and down by a factor of two. It's relatively stable, and so that's what allows us probably re almost regardless of the drive. Uh, idle, maybe we should leave aside, but we don't have idling trucks here. They're all moving. Uh, but other than that, I think we're, we're on fairly solid ground for trying to go between per unit fuel emission factors and per horsepower hour or per kilowatt hour. Uh, here's just a, a sense of, oh, I see another question, please. Uh, the question was, what, what's the CPC? And we have both water and butanol CPCs operating. Uh, that, uh, and I'll have some, have some results on comparisons of those two. Yes. Uh, here are um, just a sense of the time series, right? I said we're making measurements every second as individual trucks drive by. And so here's three trucks driving by. You can see the peaks associated with them. We look to make sure we see CO2. Okay? And if we see CO2, then we, we go ahead and calculate emission factors for everything, regardless of whether there's peaks for the other pollutants, right? There could be clean trucks where all you see is fuel, emitted as in the form of CO2, and the NOx and particle emissions are very low, we don't want to throw that out. We keep it, and we report it as a close to zero emission factor if we see a CO2 spike without associated NOx and PM. Uh, the, first, uh, the first one that, that's sort of shaded in color, you can see both particles, NOx, and black carbon all co-occurring with CO2, and the emission factors there are shown for that uh, individual truck, right, in units of grams or numbers. Uh, grams of pollutant or numbers of particles per unit fuel, right? So that kilogram to the minus one is kilograms of diesel fuel burned in the denominator of the emission factor by carbon balance. The way we got that was uh, taking the integral of the colored peak divided by the integral of the CO2 peak, right? And then by carbon balance, you can say grams of pollutant per gram of fuel. Uh, then the second truck, uh, you can see had a high CO2 peak, a high NOx peak, and no PM, right? So we get low PM emission factors. And then third, just had a CO2 peak and nothing else. So you'd have, you'd have low emission factors for all pollutants in that third case. And we saw, you know, we saw the entire landscape of trucks with high emissions for one, both, or neither, uh, NOx and PM. Uh, and, and so the, the interesting point then is to sort of characterize the distribution of emission factors uh, that we observe in this location. And uh, you know, we measured emissions from uh, many hundreds of trucks, thousands even, I think, over the entire uh, period of the study, but we had some special cases where the same truck drove by more than once. And we thought, let's look at that, because that's interesting. Uh, people say, oh, you're just taking snapshots, you know, you need to do, have a full drive cycle before you can say anything about diesel emissions. And my response to that is, you know, I agree, we have not characterized all possible driving modes here. We're not seeing high-speed highway. We're not seeing, you know, uphill climbing. It's a pretty flat road. It's more like city driving speeds. But we're taking a lot of snapshots, taking a lot of snapshots of these emissions. And especially for NOx and to a lesser degree black carbon, the results are quite repeatable, right? So this is 200 trucks that were measured more than once. How well the repeat measurements are correlated with one another. So R squared is nearly 0.8 for, for NOx and closer to 0.7 for black carbon. Uh, a little bit less repeatable. Let me see if I can move on here. The NO2, which remember I said we were measuring by difference, NOx minus NO instead of directly, and the ultrafine particles, which I think are, are fundamentally just more variable with operating conditions, those were not as repeatable as the NOx and black carbon. I think NOx is probably our best case. Pollutant and black carbon is good. The other pollutants are a little more, uh, a little more variable. Uh, so for individual trucks, I'm hesitant to make strong conclusions about NO2 and UFP. But on a, on, if we have a lot of snapshots, we could take an average and still maybe get some useful, you know, useful insights into what's going on. Then there was a question from the floor a few minutes ago about which kind of CPC we were using, water or butanol-based. And I answered, well, we're using both. And so the left panel on this slide 
compares the results of the UFP, or particle number, I'll call them, uh, emission factor. We actually are measuring not just ultrafine below 100 nanometer. We're, we're including some counts of bigger particles. The total count is certainly dominated by ultrafines. But anyway, this is just maybe a semantic issue. But I'm saying PN instead of UFP here, because in, technically we're, we're, we're going up higher than just the ultrafine particle range. But it's a, it's a small contribution to the total number. OK, so I wanted to talk about this left panel here. And uh, the, the intercept is 0. We're close to 0. That's great. That's what we want it to be. And the slope is about 0.7. Okay, so that says the, the, the correlation is beautiful, 0.86. Right? So they're well correlated. And there's a 30% systematic offset with the butanol reading lower than the water. So I think the moral of the story is, as you're thinking about uh, studies of ultrafine particle emissions, just recognize that the details of how the measurements weight made, they matter. And you know, whereas NOx and, and black carbon or PM are kind of well-established, more repeatable measurements, the ultrafines, there can be both inherent variability in the truck emissions and instrument-specific differences in you know, what comes out of the, of the measurement. And on the right-hand panel here, we have uh, the FMPS, remember, which is giving size resolved measurements. So we add up all the bins to get a total. And that uh, is not as well correlated. Uh, and the, the, there's, there's more of a difference in the absolute numbers. So I think the FMPS is valuable for giving us information about distribution. Uh, but I'd say be careful about you know, adding it up. And, and uh, it'd be good to have a CPC as well. Uh, as the FMPS, if you're interested in total particle number counts. OK, so coming back to sort of more practical details now of the port and the truck fleet that was operating there, I have three different age distributions, before, during, and after the um, sort of various phases of the dredge truck ratio regulation taking effect. So in gray, back in uh, 2008, was the pre-existing, uh, this was a truck survey of ports leaving the gates at the Port of Oakland, port trucks. And uh, you can see sort of a big peak between uh, 1994 and 2000 model year. So the, the truck fleet was, uh, in 2008, was 8 to 15 years old. Okay, it was sort of the, the peak in the age distribution. Almost no new equipment. Right? Look, on, look, on the, look at this gray series. I mean, there's still a little bit of it left here. But in 2008, there was just almost nothing in terms of new equipment. And then there's this big hump here. And there was a tail of just increasingly ancient trucks, right, still operating at the port. Uh, you know, th those trucks are not any more useful in long haul interstate service. They're probably more, they're not, they're not the best fuel economy. They're not the most reliable. You don't have a breakdown on a long haul trip in the middle of nowhere. Uh, so th these old trucks are getting really used kind of towards the end of their life in short haul service near the ports. And unfortunately, they're being used in urban areas close to lots of people. Right? I'd love to put them out on the interstates far away from people because they're dirty and old and high emitting. And unfortunately, from an air quality and health point of view, we've got these, the, historically anyway, we've had the oldest and highest emitting equipment right in the cities, right close to people. Not a good, from a public health point of view, right? not a good way to run things. But obviously, there are other dimensions, such as reliability and fuel economy, that the truck operators are thinking about in terms of selecting equipment for different applications. Chris, I saw you had a question. Uh, the 2008 was for, uh, a separate study done by the port itself to survey the age distribution of trucks. But the uh, red and blue are our data uh, from based on license plate surveys while we were doing our field measurements. Correct. There was no drainage truck registry then. I don't know the exact number, but I think it was quite high. So definitely, you know, the, the majority, let's say, for sure. And I, I think stronger than that. More than half, for sure, and I think a higher, higher percentage. Uh, OK, so let's look then at how things evolved. We talked about the baseline in 2008. Uh, the first step, you can see uh, in blue in 2011, all the 93 and older are gone, right? Remember, they were banned. Okay, so that blue, just, it just stops abruptly right here because the older trucks are not allowed. And then all of these, this big, this big hump here between 
94 and 2003, if they're there in blue, that means they had to have been retrofit with a filter. Okay, so there was significant retrofitting, unlike the Port of LA, which we'll talk about more later, where they just replaced all the, all the trucks with newer equipment. Here at the Port of Oakland is an interesting kind of counterpoint where there was significant retrofitting activity of the older trucks. And then uh, there's this huge spike of 2005 and 2006 trucks, right? So the first round of compliance said, either let's do a retrofit or let's buy a used truck. Let's buy not a new truck, that's expensive. Let's buy a used truck for cheap or cheaper. Um, and those 2005 and 2006 had a couple of years that they were still allowed without filters to operate at the port. And I advanced my slide a little too quickly there. And then in the last round, uh, when everything had to have a filter, uh, maybe the interesting point is that there was almost no retrofitting, right? These 2005s and 2006s, which were such a popular option in the first round, there was no ret or almost no retrofitting there. It was just, okay, now we're going to have 2007, 8s, and 9s, right? Well, those are trucks that had the filters right from day one when they were sold new. So it's interesting. I think there's some interesting insights into thinking about how the fleet operators respond to this regulatory pressure to modernize and clean up their fleet. And uh, a key insight, I guess, is that used trucks, compliant used trucks, are a preferred option because they're a low-cost option compared to new equipment. OK, so now let's turn to results. Uh, these are emission factors for black carbon, which was one of the, it's, it's one of the main components of diesel PM, more than half of the PM mass, typically, in a diesel exhaust, in a diesel truck. And this was the major focus, right, of the drayage truck regulation, at least its first round, was to control diesel PM emissions. And so on the left-hand side in, in gray are the fleet average emissions in three different years, before and then step one and step two. Uh, so by uh, 2013, 100% uh, of the trucks had diesel particle filters. Here it was a little more than uh, half of them, and here it was 2% of the trucks with particle filters. Right, so over the space of about four years, we went from 0% to 100% diesel particle filter equipped trucks, and the black carbon emission factors fell by 75, 76%. Okay, so uh, the reduction is, is impressive, but what's really impressive to me is how quickly this occurred. Right? So we've been measuring diesel truck emissions at the Caldecott Tunnel. My students and I, including Tom, were there at 1996, and then we went back in 2000, uh, 2006, 2007, and we didn't see emission reductions this large over a decade if you're just going to rely on natural fleet turnover. So this accelerated fleet turnover, it really worked in getting newer trucks and cleaner trucks into the mix quickly and bringing fleet average emissions down much faster than they would have otherwise come down if we'd just been relying on fleet turnover. Fleet turnover is very slow. for that. These heavy-duty trucks can have service lives of a million miles or more. And uh, you know, um, several decades. They last longer than cars. And uh, I think it's a challenge on the national side of how to get fleet turnover to push, uh, to push aggressively enough to offset growth and, uh, and this slow, natural rate of fleet turnover in the heavy duty diesel sector. On the right hand side of the plot, um, in color, are the different technology groups where we have the license plates of each truck. So we classify them into this is just the 2011 and 2013 data. And we put the trucks into, into four bins, a retrofitted truck with a filter in blue, a truck with no filter at all in gray. Those were 2004, 5, and 6, right, which were kind of allowed without, at least in the first year, were allowed, still allowed at the port. And then in red, 2007 to 2009, those trucks had filters right from day one when they were new. And then the newest trucks, 2010, there weren't very many of them yet, but they had not only particle filters, but also the SCR, the catalytic converter for NOx. And so interestingly, we found both the retrofit and the, the new OEM trucks with filters were about the same. They both, both retro, the retrofits work just as well as the new trucks in terms of lowering diesel PM. Okay, so that's an interesting, it's, it's, a, it's a relatively low cost compared to buying a, a newer truck. It's, it's more cost effective maybe to think about retrofitting a filter on an older truck. Uh, and that worked just as well as the filters on new trucks. Uh, and the, the, the best trucks are the, the brand new equipment with, uh, as, I don't think the SCR itself was really necessarily helping the PM as much, but the filters are brand new and maybe there have been some improvements in the design of the systems. Uh, and anyway, um, moving along, uh, we can even, yeah, another question. Yeah. 
Yeah, good question. So the, the question, the question is, how, uh, what's the failure rate? And I'm going to get to that in a couple of slides. Uh, right now, I'm showing averages, and your question is about the distribution and how many high outliers are there. And I have a, I have a little bit of a busy slide, but I, I have some some answers for you on that in, in a few minutes. Uh, but here, let's let's before we get down to the individuals. Uh, another question here. Yes, please. Well, so the question is, are the filter and the SCR, selective catalytic reaction, are there interactive effects between those two control devices? And there are some interactions uh, because the, the catalytic converter is there to control NOx, and the filter upstream of it is converting uh, an exhaust stream that's all NO into a mix of NO plus NO2, and that, that's relevant for the performance of the SCR system. So that's an upstream to downstream effect, right? The filter, which comes first, affects the design and operation of the SCR system by changing the speciation of the NOx. The, the kinetics of NOx reduction depend on what fraction of the, is in NNO and versus NO2 point. Uh, I suspect, I'm not sure of the details, but I suspect there's also issues that you really need to prevent particles from getting, or want to prevent particles from getting into the SCR system. Uh, so there may be an interaction like that, that you really need the filter there to, to protect the downstream SCR. Good point. So that's uh, so now the, the comment is it's not just an interaction between the two control devices, but there's also possibilities of changing the way you operate the engine. And so without the SCR, you probably would have operated the engine with a lot more exhaust gas recirculation to control NOx. And the use of SCR might allow you to back off on that and, re, and also recalibrate the, fuel in, the, the timing of the fuel injection. So it's, it's actually a very co complicated question you've asked. Uh, and there's a lot of possible interplay between not only the two control devices, but also the engine, right? The source of the pollution. And uh, the SCR is well integrated with the engine computer and engine operation. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of interactions uh, among the control devices and, uh, and uh, what's coming out of the engine itself. Good, good question. Uh, let's see. And thanks for the help on the answer, Chris. Um, OK, so I wanted to talk to you about the breakdown of uh, emission factors uh, now by uh, in blue, we're showing the different installers of retrofit filters, right? There were four different companies that were out installing diesel particle retrofits. And there were, uh, you know, a number on the, on the red, we're showing the, the engine manufacturer now, because this is OEM equipment with filter. And I need to be a little careful here before I make strong conclusions, because there are error bars, and they overlap, right, in a lot of cases. So you see a trend visually, and you say, aha, so-and-so is lower or higher than so-and-so. And you know, if the, if, they, if the confidence intervals overlap, we should just say, well, maybe there's a trend there, but there's not, there's not enough uh, statistical significance or sample size to make strong conclusions. But what I can say on the blue, on the retrofit side, is that the Donaldson and the Johnson Matthey are lower than the engine control system, right on average. Those black carbon emission factors are lower for those two retrofit uh, providers compared to the third one that I mentioned. And I uh, hesitate to say anything about Clear because the, the, we only sampled a small number of trucks that they'd retrofit. And you can see there's an enormous confidence interval there. So there's, there's really nothing to say on that side. And on the OEM side, on the, on the, in the red here, uh, I, I really hesitate to make any conclusions. Caterpillar does look to be at the low end of the range. But the, the uncertainty range extends up, I think, pretty much to the low end of the Detroit diesel, which is at the high end of the range. So it's tough to make strong conclusions on the red plots about differences by manufacturer. Uh, but we do see on the retrofit side, we do, some, do, we do see some differences that are significant depending on who, who installed the filter uh, or maybe the specifics of the materials and equipment and the quality uh, of the equipment they installed. I, I, don't have, I don't have specific explanations for why. All I can say is we do see these differences uh, with uh, sample sizes of about 100 engines in each category. So this is an example of uh, how the dredge truck registry allowed us to dig deeper into the data and to start, start to show uh, uh, breakdowns uh, you know, by, by uh, engine manufacturer, retrofit installer. And these may be policy relevant for the agency, ARB, as you think about the durability of uh, emission control systems and follow up with uh, either retrofit installers or, or engine manufacturers 
if uh, you know if the rates of uh, if the perform EMU's performance of the emission systems is uh, if differences are starting to appear there. Okay, so there was a question about the high emitters that you asked, and, and here's the busy slide with the answer. So good luck figuring out the answer to the question, but here it is, okay? Um, so there's a, there's a, so far we've been looking at averages, which are shown in the middle of these box and whiskers, but really the point that's being emphasized on this slide, and the spectacular cases are four of them here, 2004, 2006 with no filters, and then two of these, uh, 2007, 2009, those were trucks originally equipped with filters, and so those four trucks are, are way up off scale, even off the, off the y-axis range that's shown on the plot, uh, ranging from seven to seven, or nine to 17 grams of black carbon per kilogram of fuel burned. And uh, I, I think what I would say in addition is that as we've now reached a point where diesel particle filters are universal, a lot of the remaining emissions now are coming from these outliers. Right before, you'd say, well, there was a fleet average baseline that was significant. But now all of the trucks in principle have black carbon controls. And so the remaining emissions are not coming uniformly from everything that's there, that everyone's low at this new low average value. Now there's a lot of close to zero and a few extreme highs. Okay, so there's a fundamental change in the character of the distribution once control equipment has become a universal feature of the fleet that the emissions now become dominated by either the malfunctioning or the, the the poorly maintained engines, uh, and that, that's where a lot of the remaining emissions come from. That's happened for black carbon. It will happen for NOx by 2023 once SCR is universal as well. So historically, uh, you know, there was still this issue of uh, maybe because of a fuel injector tip being broken or something like that, there'd be too much fuel injected and, and there'd be a, a black carbon high emitter. But I think the distribution has become even more skewed uh, now that the control equipment is uh, is basically pulling most of the trucks down to close to zero emission levels for black carbon. So it's a key point going forward, once we have a highly controlled fleet, that these high outliers are going to be responsible for a bulk of the, of the remaining emissions. Yeah, so I've got 2011. For each year, there's actually it's such a busy plot, but there's, there's a, a left and a right uh, data series for each year. Uh, and the... 2004 to 2006, all of those either had, actually there weren't very many 2004 to 2006 left in the second year, but yeah, good point. There's uh, repeat measurements of the, the trucks. So the blue is, uh, again, is the retrofits. The gray is the trucks without filters. The red is the OEM. And then the last in purple is both particle filter and uh, catalytic converter for NOx. Correct. Yeah. Yes. There we're talking about, uh, uh, the question is how, how come the, the y-axis scale goes down below zero into the negative region? Uh, I don't think that it's trucks are cleaning the environment. That's not really the right um, message. It's that um, we have some, uh, uh, these are low emission factors, and we have a background of pollution around the port, and we're seeing some noise in the, uh, in the background, or a signal to noise ratio issue, um, especially if the CO2 plume is not, you know, is not super strong. But um, basically, I would say that's a problem with uh, when the emission level is very low, and there's a polluted background that you're trying to find this emission. You might be unlucky and get a, a negative, you know, have a negative dip in the noise right at the time a truck drives by, and you calculate a ne negative emission factor. But they're not large negative values. Basically, I would say those are just those are just clean trucks with low emissions. Uh, at the back, uh, I am not sure to the answer to that question. Uh, we can go back here, but I'm not sure we have concentration scale. So yeah, there is a scale. So CO2 peaks are up over a thousand ppm. So it's diluted exhaust still. It's like, this is not raw exhaust. We've got we've got ambient air. Um, and actually, one of the days we had trouble was high wind day, right? And then there was just too much dilution of the exhaust plumes. So you want conditions to be, you know, somewhat stagnant. Not a high wind day is not a great day to do this kind of field study. Uh, we want we wanted to get at least 10% above the ba the baseline for CO2 to be confident that we were seeing a, a plume, not just noise. Uh, 
Yes, so the question is on the CO2, what was the criterion for saying, okay, we've had a successful plume capture and we wanted to see a 10% elevation above the background uh, to be confident that we were seeing real signal rather than noise. Now we knew when the trucks were coming by because we had video. So we're not just sort of randomly searching for, oh, there's a bounce in CO2. We have specific times when we know to look and then we have either success or failure depending on whether the CO2 um, gets up clearly above the background. So you can imagine a truck that's maybe uh, got an empty container and that uh, the driver's got foot off the accelerator that you know, might, might not have a strong CO2 clone. Uh, a bigger problem for us actually in this setting is when a pack of trucks, remember there's this stoplight, so you say a pack of four or five of them all come by together, you still see a big plume, but you can't point to an individual truck and say this peak matches this truck. That was actually more of a challenge in this, in this location. So if anything, too many trucks at the same time can be problematic as well. You had a follow-up? Um, so the regen, I think, would be an issue for ultrafine particles in the actively regenerated systems, uh, which is, you know, a fraction of the trucks would have that, not all of them. Uh, but I don't think the NOx and black carbon would be so affected by regen events. Um, uh, there's one more. I'm probably going to need to push on a little bit here. but Okay, yeah, I think I'm, I, I love the discussion, but I, I know everyone's time is finite, so I won't, uh, let's move along. Uh, let's see. Okay, particle number emission factors. Okay, so this is turning more to the ultrafine particles. Uh, the black carbon has clearly gone down. The question is, did ultrafine particles go up, go down? What happened there? Uh, so these 2004 to 2006 trucks in gray were without filters. And they had the highest ultrafine. The retrofit in blue and the OEM trucks in red uh, were both lower. And the lowest with, with these brand new trucks, so they're not, low, not, not uh, large numbers of them. So what I'd say uh, on the story for ultrafine particles, others had expressed concerns that diesel particle filters might lower mass and, and at the same time lead to higher number emissions. We did not see that at the port. We saw lower ultrafine particle emissions, not higher, uh, which is, I think, good news. Um, and this question of the actively regenerated uh, uh, filter systems that might give you an occasional pulse of ultrafines whenever a regen event occurred, that might to some extent be part of the average of the red, but it was not a large enough effect to make any difference. The, the blue are all passively regen, right? So the, the blue does not have those, uh, those pulses of ultrafines associated with regenerated events. And uh, whatever active regen effect there is on uh, particle, at least in this setting, at least in this city driving setting, there's no noticeable increase even from active regen, and the ultrafine particles are lower, not higher than the trucks without filters. So I don't know that that's a complete answer to the question, but that's our answer to the question based on the kinds of driving we observed at the port. You know, I can't tell you if the story would be different on the highway conditions. We didn't observe that, uh, those kind of driving conditions here. There may not have been that much active regen even going on at the, under the conditions of trucks driving uh, here at the, at the port. Uh, we have size distribution data. Uh, I think the main feature I want to draw your attention to is this, uh, this gray again is the trucks without filters. And you see a big peak out at about 80 nanometers where we have a lot of black carbon. And that peak really disappeared once the filters were uh, uh, used in all of the other cases. And there's a smaller uh, ultrafine peak down around 10 nanometers where there's a persistent peak, right, even in the trucks with, uh, with filters. Uh, turning to NOx, again, same as the earlier slide for black carbon, I show fleet average emission rates. Uh, and we were actually initially a little bit surprised that the NOx went down. We thought, great, we're going to look at a program that control PM. And we scratched our heads initially and said, well, why on earth did this, all this filter installing have such an effect on NOx? Should have affected PM. Uh, our conclusion was it was not the filters themselves, but rather it was modernization of the fleet a shift in the age distribution to more of the newer trucks that had advanced EGR systems. And uh, that, the, the, it's fleet modernization rather than the filters themselves that, that are the, the main storyline explaining the NOx reductions. About a factor of two, right? About a 50% reduction in NOx. Uh, maybe not as expected as the PM 
uh, but I think we came around to understanding why there were some NOx reductions in this, in this program. It's not, there's not a lot of SCR on these four trucks, right? There's only up to maybe 10% of the trucks in the last year at SCR. So we haven't yet seen a lot of SCR benefit uh, in this setting. And instead, what, what we're showing here is, um, is fleet modernization effect, age distribution, shifts in the age distribution of the trucks, and probably more EGR, use of EGR in the, in the newer truck models. So you see that in the, in the colored panels on the right, the oldest retrofit trucks have the highest NOx. The trucks without filters were lower. The 2007 to 2009 in red. So this goes from oldest to newest, right? The four colored bands are just oldest to newest trucks, and the NOx go down in steps as the trucks get newer and newer. And the SCR trucks in purple on the far right are the lowest for NOx as we'd expect. So the, then the question of NO2, that um, the, uh, you know, the fraction of the NOx present coming out of the engine got converted to NO2. You can see that uh, both the retrofit in blue and the OEM trucks in red had high primary NO2, much higher than the trucks without filters in gray. And maybe an important point about SCR, we think about it, you know, SCR is there to control NOx. That's true, but it also has an important role in mitigating the, the increase in primary NO2 emissions associated with diesel particle filters. So think of the SCR systems as having two important air quality goals, not just a reduction in total NOx, but also dealing with this NO2 issue associated with diesel particle filters in the regeneration scheme, the passive regeneration scheme. So I think both features are important. And maybe we, we think of SCR as really a NOx control. And, and the fact that it also helps with this NO2 issue, NO2 issue is um, important to remember that. Uh, so the highest, uh, highest trucks, I guess another important question when you think about the merits of retrofitting versus replacing trucks. Uh, the retrofit gives you higher exposure to this NO2, primary NO2 emission issue, because there's a higher baseline NOx. So you can see in this right-hand panel the NO2 to NOx fraction, right? It's 15% in the low 20 percent. So you'd say, well, gosh, these trucks should be higher for NO2 because they have a higher NO2 fraction. But no, um, you know, the NO2 fraction multiplies these numbers. You multiply NO2 fraction by the total amount of NOx, and these blue ones, 15% of this, right, is more than 22% of this. So it's both the NOx emission rate and the, and the NO2 to NOx ratio. My conclusion is probably a, a, a flashing yellow light, at least, in terms of doing retrofits on older trucks, is there's more vulnerability to getting this primary NO2 emission being a higher higher concern because there's higher baseline NOx when you talk about retrofitting older engines. I'm going to skip that slide, and I'm going to get to summary of major findings. Uh, so over this period of four years, less than four years actually, because it's November in the first year and March in the last year, so let's say three and a half years, we had, uh, over a very short time period, we had major decrease in black carbon by a factor of 75 or so percent, significant decrease in NOx by a factor of two, and then the primary NO2 emissions increased from 3 to 18% of the total NOx, and that's associated with the diesel particle filters. Uh, I just mentioned this point of really being impressed at how rapidly these changes occurred. Uh, and I'll uh, also have a, one last bullet on the ultrafine particles. Uh, that our, our assessment based on the port results is that ultrafine particles went down, not up. And that seems to be an unsettled question, right, in the field about what's the effect of diesel particle filters on ultrafines. Uh, our reading of the results is that they went down. And uh, the, I think I'll, I'll leave it there. I have, some, I have some other slides, but I think we've uh, uh, spent enough time talking about the results of the study. And uh, I'd be happy to take any more questions. Thank you for, your, thank you for coming. Thank you for sponsoring the work to ARB. And uh, uh, thanks for your time and attention. We have a microphone if you want to ask additional questions. Questions? One there. Uh, into, into the mic. A question about the uh, fuel composition itself of the diesel. Did that have any effect on uh, the emissions that you were reading? Uh, we didn't study the fuel composition as an explicit variable, so that's an advantage of lab studies, right, is you can do these fuel, fuel effect studies, or fuel effect uh, can treat that as a variable. 
Um, my assessment is the major fuel changes happened back in the 1990s, the diesel, when we went to the low aromatics. And uh, there was another key change, which was ultra low sulfur diesel. But that was 2006. That was prior to everything uh, that I reported in this study. So the sulfur content should have been stable throughout the period of the, of the field work here. Bob. Some broader questions. Is the uh, fraction of the port of Oakland emissions that come from the dredge feet fleet sufficient that you would expect to see changes in the ambient monitor? I believe there is one in that area, right? Uh, good point. So there is, a, there is an ambient air monitoring station operated by the Bay Area Air Quality Management District. It's in West Oakland. It's on the other side of Highway 880 in the community, close to where the people are living. And uh, there's an ethylometer there measuring black carbon. Uh, it started in 2008. And we can't see a big reduction in black carbon uh, coinciding with this reduction in the dredge trucks. But there's a lot of other general purpose trucks on the highway. There's also rail lines. Uh, and, and so I, I think my answer is we will see ambient air quality benefits in communities. But we need the statewide truck and bus rule to get broader traction on you know, the entire diesel truck fleet statewide. And this is, uh, um, this is something that's, that's uh, still coming rather than already achieved. One only quick question. The uh, high emitter trucks, uh, has anybody approached you to use that data to follow up on those trucks to see what's wrong with them? I think that would be, uh, would be, we didn't do any follow up with the individual trucks, but there is a, in our final report to ARB, there is a complete archive of, you know, every truck with license plate and emission factors. So in, in principle, that follow up is possible. And, uh, you know, I think one of the interests, uh, you know, on just understanding, uh, you know, in a pilot sort of, or, or not in a pilot scale, but understanding the dredge truck regulation, it's also sort of to looking at this approach as a possible enforcement measure for operating, say, on highway bridges around the state and uh, flagging trucks for follow-up roadside inspection based on a high reading uh, on road. So, you know, that, that I would say it's at least feasible to think about that kind of approach. Uh, I, I believe most of the enforcement efforts are currently either happening at places like ports and rail yards or at way stations. But, you know, it, it would be possible to think about doing that kind of act activity in other places as well. And this might provide a useful screening to kind of help focus on pulling over trucks that are at least possibly of concern. Uh, we have a question from Don Stedman uh, over the webcast. And the question is, uh, our 2013 OMS data, now that refers to the, the ARB contract with Don Stedman, where he sampled at uh, Port of LA and I believe at Cottonwood as well. Our 2013 OMS data seem to show average black carbon and PM mass emissions by engine manufacturer for all 2007 compliant heavy duty trucks at the Port of LA with the same pattern as yours. But our numbers seem almost an order of magnitude lower. Ours look closer to whatever an applicable standard might approximate. Do you think that one year later measurements could have gone up that much? We have yet to get a good valid 2015 black carbon and PM ohms averages, but it will be taking a little bit of time. So question being like his um, 2013 data is an order of magnitude lower than yours. Okay, so I, I was having a little bit of trouble hearing because there was sort of an echo in the room, but I think I got, I got the key points of the question. And uh, so I think my answer is no, it's not. You're not going to get an order of magnitude change in fleet emissions in one year. The, um, the port trucks are, uh, you know, pretty much universally filter equipped. Uh, the, the trucks in the Reading truck, uh, the, the, was it the Reading truck station? Yeah, he's talking about the port of LA actually and comparing with the right. port of Oakland. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so there it's a more fair comparison that the, the same kind of emission controls would be present on both fleets. And they were measuring an order of magnitude higher or lower at Port of LA? They are lower than yours. Okay. Yeah. For so, the same model year, I believe. I don't have an explanation for that, that difference. Uh, you know, there, there are different approaches to the measurement. Um, and there may be different, different kinds of driving, I think, maybe is the most, likely, the most likely explanation. These are trucks going 30 miles an hour. Uh, I believe the Port of LA was uh, lower speed operation. Uh, but yeah, it starts that, from that like would, a standstill. That would be yeah. an important question if you, if you, so the reason that I think these comparisons are fair, one, one year to another, right, is that we feel like the driving was the same in both years. 
but if you go to a different site where there's different grade or different, uh, different speeds, that, that, uh, that's a harder comparison to make because you're not, you're not controlling, controlling engine load between the two studies. Uh, one more question from the webcast and then we'll go back to the, to the audience here. Uh, this is from Dean Atkinson. Uh, Rob, great talk and wonderful work. Most of the changes that you are talking about relate to heavy duty truck engines for which advances are tremendous. Do you have any inside guesses about how long it will take for all the other diesel sources such as locomotives, construction and other NR equipment to start to have better engines? Or is aggressive retrofitting a better prospect for fixing that part? Okay. Um, so, you know, the Port of Oakland and the Port of LA were the early action items. What's coming as the next step is the statewide on road truck and bus uh, cleanup efforts. And uh, that's on a time scale of, let's say, 2016, maybe 2018 for the last, the last few, um, you know, exemption cases. Uh, so that, that's, um, I think that's already in place. And the question is going even a step beyond that and saying, what about some of the off-road engine categories, including construction equipment and railroad locomotives and marine vessels and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, you know, there's a different answer for each one. I think the, uh, a lot of the off-road equipment, uh, such as, uh, let's say, the construction farm and so on, uh, I'm reasonably optimistic. The railroad locomotives, I'm quite pessimistic. Uh, because the, they're, they're, we're basically precluded in California from pushing, um, from pushing harder than the, the national program there. A uh, question on your uh, emission factor calculation looking at peaks. You have instruments with different response times and flow rates. Do they always have peak widths that are the same, or do you have, what, what do you do if, say, you have a really short CO2 peak but a longer black carbon peak? Good question. And you're right that the response times of the instruments are not identical. The CO2 we had operating at 10 hertz, so it was really cranking out uh, uh, much faster than some of the others. Um, we basically do try to account for smearing of the peaks like the, from some of the slower responding instruments. We'll actually set the bounds of integration differently uh, for each, uh, each pollutant peak uh, to try and account for that. But you know, ideally, we'd measure everything at 10 hertz. And unfortunately, a lot of the instruments, we can't push them harder than one hertz. So um, the, the NOx can already go faster. The ultrafine particles can go. So really, black carbon is one of the harder ones. And the size distribution, the FMPS was hard to, I mean, one, one hertz was as fast as we could go there. All right. Uh, another from uh, the webcast from Gurdas Sandhu. Uh, there are two questions. Uh, first one is, uh, do you have data about type of DPF on the trucks, catalyzed versus non-catalyzed? And the second question, which I believe you touched a little bit, uh, could the high emitting trucks be undergoing a DPF regen when they, are, when they were measured? Okay, so uh, I'm not sure beyond the installer of the, uh, filter, of the retrofit filters that we have detailed information. I, Mike, I'm looking at you. Uh, okay, I think that's a no. We don't have more details beyond who installed. Uh, the retrofit filters, and I think the same is true for the OEMs. We, we know the engine manufacturer, but you'd have to go kind of you'd have to go back a level and, and uh, uh, dig more at that level. The second part of the question, you know, was re were regen events. I'm amazed how frequently this regen question comes up, uh, and it doesn't affect the black carbon. It doesn't affect NOx. The only place that you might see an effect would be on the ultrafines. And you know, I think our results suggested there wasn't a, a big bump that we could assert. Either, either regen wasn't occurring very often in our study. I can't exclude that. Um, or, or that even if it was occurring on the, on the actively regenerated trucks, it wasn't, it wasn't bumping the UFP emissions in a way that was significant. Um, but yeah, the, the black carbon should not be affected by regen. That's, that's, that's not something that you get a big pulse when you go through a regen event. Uh, another question back here. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> um, you mentioned when you had the, the repeat trucks that uh, the ultrafine particle number had the lowest R squared. And I was just wondering if you also looked at the, uh, the mass of ultrafine particles, which I guess you'd have to use the FMPS for. 
And it might just sort of get at the question of, well, how much of that lower vari that, that increased variability might just be due to how much time the particles have had to coagulate? Maybe the smaller number counts are because the particles have gotten a little bit larger. They've collided a little bit more. Does that make sense? I think I understand the point you're making, but we didn't, we didn't really. Um, we, did do, so we did try to calculate from the FMPS data. Um, where is it now? particle mass emission rates. But the problem is that once you get up into the higher bins here, it's pretty noisy. And you're multiplying by dp cubed. So you, you end up multiplying the noise in the higher bins by large diameters and masses. You're, I guess you're down at the lower end. Okay. Yeah. It's an interesting point. We haven't looked at that. Yeah, Rob, uh, one more from the webcast uh, from Wei Li at uh, South Coast AQMD. Uh, did you measure any LNG slash CNG trucks? Uh, I think that's a, a, one of several differences between LA and the Bay Area. Uh, there was a significant amount of uh, new equipment, right, that was purchased for the port of LA that was natural gas powered. And at Oakland, we, we saw a much more diesel dominated fleet. So I don't think we have, uh, we don't have insights to add on that LNG question. Really, Don Stedman's group um, have, have a lot of information, interesting results on, on, the, on, the LNG, on the LNG side, because they saw, I think they saw many more trucks of that type at the port of LA. And we, we don't really, uh, I think the, the, the interesting feature of the, of the Oakland uh, trucks is much more this retrofitting, right? The LA port has really much more of a new equipment focus and here and the Oakland was, uh, the, the, the contrast that's interesting is the idea of retrofitting trucks as opposed to replacing them with new equipment. Uh, using NOx analysis through chemiluminescence, there's a sample degradation with non-heated lines. What is the length of the heated line versus the non-heated portion of your sample probes? Uh, our sample probe is not heated because the exhaust that we're sampling is already diluted with ambient air, right? We're down to 1,000 ppm, let's say, ballpark numbers. So there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of ambient air, and we think temperatures are also maybe still a little bit elevated, but we're not in a situation where we're worried about water condensing or issues like that. So it's, a, it's an advantage of having ambient air dilution. Uh, and and uh, you know, our, our line is long, but it's unheated. hand signals, but I'm not sure what to do here. Save my questions for last, I guess, unless I see a hand being raised. So for your uh, baseline calculation, you used uh, November 2009 data as a pre-DPF era. Correct. And I understand, like, starting January 1st, 2010, uh, the truckers were required, I believe, almost all of them to have a retrofit. So. Would the November 2009 data a uh, good representation of the baseline? I mean, I'm, I'm understanding like some of the trucks were already retrofitted by then, right? Yeah, we, we think it is a good representation. And the way I'm going to get by your question is to say that um, you're worried about the early retrofits. And in fact, the story was more there was an extension of the deadline. And it was, it was actually hard to get all the retrofits done on time. So I think there was roughly a six-month window grace period for additional retrofitting to get. We were there, I think, in. Well, anyway, we, we were there well before uh, the retrofitting had gotten underway. So January 2007, uh, 2010 was the original deadline. But practically speaking, there was sort of a six-month window and a lot of retrofitting activity still happening in the first half of 2010. So can we use the 2008 data instead? I mean, if you understand your point, but would 2008 give you, like, maybe you're underestimating the reductions here a little bit? So 2008, uh, we just have a... Uh, truck engine survey of the age distribution. We don't have emission measurements. So, so the first emission measurements we have are from fall of 2009, and that was our baseline. And yeah, I, I would love to have a time machine and be able to go back and, uh, 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 but yeah, that we, you know, we, have, we have some baseline. Uh, in the end, in the, you know, in the study here, we ended up using the 2004 to 2000 trucks, six trucks without filters as a comparison group, and that, that, you know, that's very consistent in time, and so you can look at trucks with and without filters um, without having to resort back to the 2009 baseline. I'll see a hand being raised. So the second question is, um, at the location where you measured uh, you know, all these emissions, 
what would be your exhaust or SCR temperature? So are these results for NOx a good representation of working SCR or the emissions could be actually lower or higher? Yeah, it's a, it's a good point about SCR that if the, uh, you know, if it's in a cold start mode for the engine or even if it's just idling or light load, the, the injection of diesel exhaust fluid will be turned off and the NOx control will be, you know, will not be, will not be uh, nearly as good as when the system's hot and operating normally. Uh, I, think, I think my main answer to the point is that, you know, even in our most recent year, 2013, we only had 9% of the trucks equipped with SCR. So it's not a big part of the NOx story. There are some plots uh, like this one where you say, well, that purple bar, right? That, so we do see reductions in NOx um, relative to, you know, other, the red trucks, which are without SCR. So there does seem to be, you know, these trucks have probably, many of them been driving on the highway for some time before arriving at the site. So they're, even if they're not currently at high load, they're probably still warm. Yes, it's, it's, they come off 880, and then it's that main access road to the port uh, from that. So I, I think it's likely that a lot of these trucks, they're not cold start trucks, and they're probably mostly uh, still warm from highway. Um, yeah. Uh, that's right. So, I mean, we talked about the active regenerant, uh, and that's also well taken. How was the license plate data collected? How is the license plate uh, data collected by video camera down at the roadside, um, looking looking at the trucks as they drove towards us? And we were we tried to be a bit, um, what's the word for this? Discreet with our setup of uh, camera so as not to be too visible or distracting. We we certainly didn't tell either the port or the truck operators that we were going to be there, but I think they probably saw us as they were leaving uh, the port, and they probably figured out pretty quickly that we were we were there sampling. But there was, there was no enforcement activity linked. To our study, this was purely a fleet surveillance issue. We weren't uh, we weren't coordinating with uh, district or ARB uh, enforcement staff. There was no there was nothing going on at the same time as the submission study. Uh, your system only measures uh, trucks with the tailpipe pointing up. Yes. Do you have any estimation on how many you missed that had a down pointing exhaust? Uh, you know, so, so that the, the newest trucks with modern emission controls, you can start to think about, well, let's just go with underbody exhaust now because they're, they're clean enough that we maybe don't need the extra dilution from the vertical exhaust pipes. Um, I would say the main reason we missed trucks was they came, they came, a swarm of them would come in a pack, right? And we wouldn't be able to separate. There'd be four or five at once and we couldn't, there was just too much going on too quickly. That was our main reason for missing plumes. Uh, but you know, there could be some high bias here because those trucks with underbody exhaust, I'm expecting, would be new ones with low emissions. And so, you know, if anything, we, we, the, we might be missing some of the cleanest trucks in our sample. So that, that, I, I, can't, uh, I can't dispute that as a possible source of bias in the, um, in the study. Hopefully a small fraction, though, that are that way. We, we certainly observe lots of vertical exhaust pipes on, on the majority of the trucks. Uh, one more question, Rob. So the way you pull the exhaust is obviously through a blower in the aluminum duct. How did you arrive at the flow rate? Because that's a critical factor. I mean, you don't want like a too high a flow rate because you're going to dilute, I believe, uh, gases. And if you have a, like a, a lower than nominal flow rate, uh, then you're going to lose particles. And, and the second part, I guess, to that is like you use like a corrugated uh, aluminum duct. Are, are there any losses? Did you do any kind of experiments to see that? What kind of PM or black carbon losses occur? Right. So, you know, we pick the, uh, the flow rate. All we're drawing is the, is the ambient air. There's no, there's no dilution air that we're adding into the sample line. It's all ambient air that we're pulling. We pick the flow rate and we try to have it be high so that the residence time in the aluminum duct is, uh, is, is you know, kept manageable. But it's several seconds. There is a transit time to get from the, the roadside up to the analyzers in the van. Uh, we haven't done extensive characterization of line losses. Uh, I, I think the, uh, the biggest concern would be something like ammonia. That would be, that would be you know, really problematic to do this way. I think pollutants we're doing hopefully are mostly OK. It would also be difficult to do coarse particles. But we're, we're really trying to focus more on the, on the, on the smaller particles. That sh we shouldn't have a lot of inertial losses in the line. And uh, um, the, 
NO2 might be a little bit problematic, but I think NO and CO2 should be completely fine and black carbon should be, should be reasonable also. You have an idea of uh, the time from the emissions event, basically the plume leaving the exhaust, to the time it hits your sampling manifold? Uh, that's a very short time. Uh, let's see now. Let me show a picture here. Okay, I'm hearing whispering that we need to wrap up here. I, I, you can see that there's the exhaust pipe. Maybe that's sort of a best case scenario, but it's, it's on the order of one second. It's a very short time between uh, between coming out of that pipe and going into our inlet. And what was the height that that was suspended? I mean, you had it at a uniform height from the roadway. Uh, I'm just guessing something on the order of three meters. Do you have any, uh, an idea of what your uh, residence time was in your sampling manifold? A uh, couple of seconds. OK, well, I, I hear from the, 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 uh, the whispering that the uh, seminar and the discussion are at a close. I'll stay around. I'm happy to talk with folks one on one. Thank you all again for coming. And uh, it's been a pleasure to uh, work on the study and to talk about the results with you.